Thank you very much. <laughs> hey, you're more than welcome. It's so uh, nice to have you with us uh, today. I'm actually um, setting up myself. Um, just starting the recording right now. Yeah. All righty then. Oh. Oh. oh, I can see you right now. So, um, I'm just getting my questions set up and everything else. This is just preliminary. This, believe it or not, this is the second time I've actually done an interview of a famous person. Oh, well, well, well I mean, I'm not, well, I'm famous to my mum and my dad, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, um, interviewed a filmmaker, his name was Rob Lambert. He'd done a film that was quite similar, that people said was, like, to Joker... Um, and yeah. I interviewed a guy who was from Breaking Bad. Um, his name was Raymond Cruz. He played Tuco, and he was like the menacing drug dealer. Um, so that was. Oh, right. cool. excellent. Yes. Um, so I've got a bit of repertoire to my name, and I also will be getting Funky Porcini, James Braddle, to answer a few of my questions as well for like next week. Oh yeah, you mentioned yeah, because we did a we did a remix of Funky Porsche in years ago. Um, I, it must be maybe eighteen and nineteen years ago now. I don't know. Oh blimey, <laughs> that's uh, pretty cool there. The trip hop connection, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. So, there you go. There. So um, just I, I scan through your question. So I was going to say, you're obviously you're recording. I did scan through your questions quickly, but it's been absolutely crazy this week because. We were launching another Ben EP, you know, as you already know, and all the rest of it. It's just been mad. And I've been doing all the video work and this, that, and the other, and it's just been mad. So, yeah, it's just been one of these, really. <laughs> oh, no, I totally understand. You know, work and uh, creativity comes first and uh, everything else sort of second. But um, I'm very proud of what you're doing. Um, everything from program to love to up in the air and some of the exercise part five, part four videos that you've been publishing on the... Uh, Instagram, so great job. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Yes, it's, it's quite nerve wracking coming back as Ben, you know, because we both had such a long gap from actually working together. We didn't actually know what we were going to be like in the same room together, but it was actually just without saying actually every five seconds, it's just like we'd not been apart really, you know. It was, um, yeah, it's <laughs> just back into the usual role of messing around, acting like idiots, and somehow getting music out at the same time. Well, you know, sometimes some groups, they get back together, but it doesn't always work out. Like um, Lush, for instance, they had that one EP and then they disappeared. But um, I'm glad, hopefully, the bent name will be sticking together for as long as it can be, because um, I know I should get, get on yeah. my questions uh, right here, but I will say, when I first saw some of your music videos on MTV Dance and when I was at Virgin Megastore, Many years ago, when I was in my teens, you know, it brings yeah. me back to a much simpler time when music was actually good, and MTV used to play music videos. Yeah, that's when the M actually—that's what you know, because they don't realise what M stands for, do they nowadays? Exactly, yeah, it's, it's all teenage mothers and shows about people from New Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I, you know, I, I shouldn't go out in a bit of a tangent here, but um. I will ask. I will ask the first question because uh, you're right, old yeah. mate. Um, now, before anything, um, are you related to Mike Mills from REM, or is that a question you get asked of? I've never been asked that before, but now I'm not sadly because I do. I really like REM, uh, but no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not related to Jeff Mills either. I'm not related to any of the Mills as I'm. I'm out here I'm, I'm by myself, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just were saying that for some of our curious fans who might be, um, I would call bent fans, uh, programmers or interceptors or exercisers. <laughs> um, that's my, you know, exercisers like... Exercisers at the start of the year. Insane Clown Posse, their fans are called juggalos, but they're, they're crap. Your ones are better. <laughs> So, uh, first question is, what was the main impetus for doing a reunion album of sorts for Bent? Was it a sense of nostalgia or a feeling during this pandemic that people need something light-hearted after so much darkness? I think, um, 
Well, to be honest, we've never we never really split up. It, it's funny, what it was we just naturally kind of went down our own paths in around 2007. We did intercept, and then the business was getting difficult. The industry was getting really tricky. We both our lives are going kind of you know quite different as well. Nail wanted to move move to London. I was still in Nottingham, and we both kind of wanted to do our own thing as well. You know, so we did that, and then. I ended up moving to Ireland, uh, which I've been here for like over 10 years now. Um, and I've been happily being self-indulgent with my own thing. And so it's now. But we've often said, oh, you know, maybe one day we should just get our heads together to do some more stuff. And then the years just rolled by. Um, and then I think at the start of last year, because I, I did the location on album, sort of, because <laughs> I've kind of been a lockdown here all the time anyway, because I'm in the middle of the country, in the, in the middle of nowhere, all of my friends are in England and I'm in Northern Ireland, you know. So a lot of the time I'm kind of in isolation. So it's funny to say, yeah, I mean, often I'd have people coming over to do stuff, you know, recording-wise and that. They come over and stay for a couple of weeks or whatever. But, um, yeah, it was just a case of, you know, I kind of did this, that album and we were both realising that a lot of people seem to be listening to music again that was more maybe listening music rather than dance music, you know. And we just thought it was kind of like, well, let's get our heads together but it was just before the lockdown we'd actually planned we'd actually been writing stuff about uh, just about probably about six months before um yeah sort of like the end of uh, 2019 really and the plan was actually to do a, a big full album and have lots of different vocalists on there but <clears throat> then the lockdown happened we couldn't get everything done so we thought right let's get up in the air for it let's do up in the air as a mini album and then <clears throat> we'll put all the rest of the stuff together to do the big album so we're actually in the in, in the hard disk, there's actually a, a lot of stuff ready for what we're hoping is going to be a big, big Ben album, you know. But we've just kind of, we're just waiting for the lockdown to go so we can start catching up with vocalists again and all that, you know. It's so looking forward to doing that again, yeah. Well, I'll definitely keep my ear out on what will be there is to come. I know there'll be an exercise song on there as usual. You always like to do test sound collages, but yeah, I would be very interested if you um, even bring back. Regulars like Zoe or uh, John Marsh from Beloved onto the song. Yeah. I'm actually a great fan of John Marsh because um, he. Oh, well, sorry yeah, about same. that. Because um, the sun rising and sweet harmony with the nudity music video. Yeah, no, no, there's uh, both of us are massive Beloved fans. I mean, when we were with John, it was surreal, you know. And then we obviously on that record we, we worked with Stephen Hague, who you know he produced all the Pet Shop Boy stuff, and it was just surreal working with all these. A hero, you know, but yeah, we've been speaking to John quite a lot over, over the last few years. You know, he, he keeps popping up, and we've been speaking to Rachel quite a lot as well, Rachel Foster from the Aerials album. So, but I'm also working a lot with Joel Hood, who's on my my solo stuff, at, which I also do the songs and sanctified stuff with, because he's got a very soft, he's very soft vocally, you know, and he's a great writer as well. So, yeah, there's probably going to be a lot of Joel in the new Bent um, incarnation. <laughs> Well, I'm certainly excited for it. Whatever comes your way, I'm sure it'll be much better than any sort of Dua Lipa or the, um, Chance the Rapper sort of stuff that they play on the radio. The Top 40 Billboard and UK Top 40. Um, don't listen to that stuff. I listen to whatever I like. Lately, I've been listening yeah. to um, not only you, but Add N to X. You remember that band? Oh, okay, yeah. It was like Anne <laughs> Shenton and Barry Seven. It's really sort of it's, it sounded me a little like Broadcast by Warp. I love uh, Broadcast. It's, I mean, I love an n x as well. I've actually got one of their... It's that hexagonal uh, record that I've got. It's, yeah, they, they were absolutely bonkers. And they were completely... I mean, we loved all that kind of stuff, especially because they loved all that analogue stuff, you know. Uh, and we're just analog synth freaks, you know. So, um, yeah, and n x are fantastic. Their record sleeves are always brilliant as well, you know. Oh, definitely. Um, Avant Haas, probably their best one. I know I shouldn't be promoting other people's work compared to yours, but, you know, every form of album or single LP uh, can influence another artist, and I also do music myself, and uh, I've certainly had a lot of influences in my day. You, yeah. Yours uh, included, and a few others, um, but I'll, I'll get to that a little later. The second question I wanted to ask was, Something about Bent's music is has a very atmospheric, jazzy sound. It's not quite trip pop, but it's not quite chill out ambient. 
Or is it born out of a feeling of just being quirky or unique for the sake of it? Because I, when I listen to their music, it makes me want to drink a gin and tonic. Yeah. By the coastline, <laughs> near Margate. Well, I think... Yeah. Oh, I've got anything makes me want to have a gin and tonic. Um, it's weird, because, I mean, I think we both, both Nail and I, I mean, we've got a massive love of lots of different types of music. And we weren't specifically into one genre of music. And we always used to say that we just liked getting everything and throwing it into one bag and seeing what happened, you know. So sometimes it might sound a little bit trip hoppy, and other times it might be a bit daft. But we were very influenced at the time, you know, 20 years ago. It was like listening to Massive Attack, and you had, like, the core production team and then they had these different vocalists that they worked with so we definitely had an influence from that but then I really well we both loved uh, a lot of hip-hop as well like some like Della Soul you know they were so inspirational because they were sampling just ridiculously daft records like Shibody Wadi and Hall and Ames and things like that and they were just sampling this cool soul and fun and they were just sampling all this daft stuff and you know, I used to have a lot, I mean, I still have all these records here, none of them are serious, you know, well, they are serious, the James Last and the all sorts of stuff, I can pull anything at random and you'll probably make you laugh, but we get a lot of fun out of just sampling things that make us smile, you know, go, we almost have a rule, which is like, I'll go, oh no, I don't know if we can put that in, it's just ridiculous, and now, well, no, that, it has to go in then, you know, if it sounds daft, then it has to go in, <laughs> so... Sometimes there's bits of jazzy things in there and there's Latin and there's disco and, you know, it's a whole hodgepodge, really. We always used to say when we did the first album, we wanted it to be like a, what we'd say in Nottingham is a bag of toughies, a bag of sweets, you know, it's like a, there's like a, a bonbon and there's like a, you know, there's all these different flavors, all these different sweets in one bag. That's how we kind of imagined the first album to be. So, yeah. <laughs> but that's the best thing about your music is that it has a variety of flavors and sub-genres to choose from in the same way that um, uh, Gorillaz, a much more mainstream group, uh, does sort of the same thing, but, you know, with a bigger budget with animation, they sort of have trip up one here, industrial uh, house uh, alternative They tap into so many different things that kind of resonate with people, and I think that's why they just work so well, Gorillaz, you know there's just so many really lovely sort of references to older records, especially like they're really hip hop sort of things as well, you know. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, they sometimes put De La Soul on some of their collaborations, and I think they put Snape Dagadow, the shizzle nizzle, yeah. in the song. <laughs> I know, that was a bad impersonation, but um, yeah, what I heard up in the air, I definitely had a feeling that you were treading on more sort of ethereal grounds. I'm trying to think of a particular artist that comes into mind, but maybe like a weird mix between Jean-Jacques Berry and um, Blue that's State. Right, that's you said. That, that is really weird you saying about Jean-Jacques Berry because um, I don't know why, but I actually pulled that record out yesterday because um, somebody else was asking me, well, you know, what are the 10 big influences, you know? And, well, you know, I mean, there can't be 10, but... No, there's loads of old daft influences like that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's, you seem to pick up on a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, I noticed, you know, little influences here and there with uh, music and sound, uh, which even brings me to the next question as well regarding influence as, as concerned, whether it be Up in the Air, Intercept, or Everlasting Blink, or Program to Love. What were the strongest for you? Like the Canterbury scene sound, like Robert Wyatt, Jazz Fusion, Dream Pop or Shoegaze, like um, Cocktail Twins, My Bloody Valentine. Uh, I think yeah. I said Jazz Fusion, like Chick Corea, Rest in Peace, and uh, Ethereal New Wave, like Tangerine Dream and Talk Talk. Well, I mean, the last set, definitely. I mean, I'm, an eight, I'm just such an 80s lover. I mean, Tangerine Dream did the, the, the theme scene to Street Hawk, you know, so I'm going to love that set. But I mean, to be honest with you, we love... It's difficult to pin it on one thing, because we actually used to listen to Weather Report. Now they're going to laugh at it, because it's just so all over the place, it's mad. I, it, it's weird. We, we wouldn't be sort of... I mean, Nail's got such a vast ra range of music that he listens to. I, I'm just sort of stuck in the 80s and listen to lots of soundtracks and just love da daft music as well. But Nail would, you know, his record collection just spans so much stuff and lots of jazz and this and that. It's crazy, really. So, 
Yeah, I guess you kind of could say all of the above, really, because we loved a lot of ambient stuff as well, and obviously all the stuff that was on Walk Records back in the day, and yeah, it's everything really. You know, a lot of the ambient stuff. I loved global communication. <laughs> Massive fan of global communication. 76, 17, 76, 14, I've got that album at home. Um, yeah. Before I started having to sell my records for a bit of cash, but yes, that was an influence of mine as well. Yeah, it's a, just a beautiful album, yeah. I mean, I, but I remember I used to listen to that a lot, and that was in the years leading up to Ben, you know. And then, yeah, it's funny really because... You know, it's um, a lot of that music as well. I remember them saying that you could make a lot of music with very little gear. You know, I remember I remember Tom Middleton saying that you could have an Akai S3000, you could have a, a Space Echo or whatever. Or, uh, sorry, it was a Boss SE50 Reverb or something. And that's all you need, really, to make that kind of music. And I can remember thinking, that, wow, I don't actually need that much gear. And at the time, we had nothing, you know. It's even like the Apex when he started out. He didn't. He was kind of an inspiration in a lot of ways because I mean, you know, he's always had a lot of some amazing gear in that. But a lot of the production was so lo-fi that it kind of made you think. Especially back in the early nineties when everybody was trying to make everything sound amazingly clean. You know, it was kind of an inspiration to everyone who had a four track. You know, so yeah. I, I would agree with that too. Um, I know, like you said, Apex Twin, especially from his earlier years on Reflex. I don't know what happened to yeah. that label. I think they disbanded. That was a uh, very sort of weird because you um, implement and control his modules and little toys and gears. Uh, that was very effective. But I know he's on the more sort of dark and more disturbing end of electronica, especially if you've seen "Come to Daddy" and "Window Liquor." I I remember when I first oh, saw yeah, that. Um, oh. I was like, mm, I probably shouldn't watch that. When I did, I was like eleven. <laughs> Yeah, the window lick is just like the maddest. I remember that coming out and just thinking, and he's always been ahead of the curve. That's the thing about him. He's always just been just so far ahead of the curve to, to everybody else. It's kind of frightening, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, the first Selected Ambient 1 and 2 are still my favourites, really. You know, I just every time I listen to them, I just think, God, you know, it's simple but beautiful and dusty and atmospheric and brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> For me, it's a I care because you do, because like Program for oh, Love, really? it was a yeah, mix a of bad, hodgepodge of sub-genres that were included. Some that were extremely noisy, that gave me a little tinnitus like uh, Ventolin, and then softer stuff like, um, I think it was like the Waxen. <laughs> it was an anagram yeah. for his name. It's got some oh, strange titles. Yeah, yeah. I used to love Mike and Rich as well, the stuff they did with Mike Paradinus. That always made me laugh. In fact, in fact, when I first met Nail, I remember, because that was almost like how Ben started off, because we were messing around. All, we were living together, and we weren't planning to do anything serious together. We said, oh, let's just sample anything we want, and we were like being as ridiculous as we could. So when we put the drum machine on, we weren't trying to make anything cool sounding. I was trying to make really daft, sped up bossanovas or something, you know. And we were just drinking loads of vodka and basically <laughs> trying to make each other laugh. That's actually the core of it, is most of the time we're trying to make each other laugh. So we'll end up programming things. Like when they, when they had Cubase, I can remember we used to think, how can we use this software in the way that it wasn't intended to be used? You know, <laughs> but so sampling bagpipes and reversing them and then putting, you know, some opera on the top of it or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I could definitely imagine how um, a song like Thick Ear or um, Willie Top Mary was probably produced. Like, hey, that's happy. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, they were very much, they, they were kind of born out of when acid, not the drug, uh, the, the software, when that came about where you could time... Hello? Straight like a mod. They made us listen to the bin, like, right, now we can... Actually, stretch, stretch any audio to anything else, and without having to put it into tiny bits, it was crazy. You know, that was just before we moved over to Ableton when we did those. Yeah, <laughs> I'll definitely have to see about that sort of software. Um, because usually when I make music, especially my early years under MXQ, which stands for Macrocosmic Expansion Queries, I um mostly just used Magix and GarageBand. That was some of the earliest stuff I used. Now I'm using GarageBand again on my iPad, and it's doing just a job for me because, um, unfortunately, I know this will sound ridiculous, I'm not that wealthy. I can't afford all the toys for such electronic no, instruments. <laughs> I could never afford a Moog or even a Korg growing up, 
but when I have the time and chance, I'll definitely get yeah. one so I can compete with the big boys. Well, you know what? Honestly, the truth is, I mean, it's like when we did um, when we did always, because um, a lot of people said, "Oh, what's the bass sound on that?" You know, and it was a Yamaha home keyboard. It wasn't a Moog or anything, or a Moog. You know, it wasn't anything like that. It's quite funny actually because when we went to do that live, I actually went through all about different synths. At one point, we had about forty-five different synths. We had everything, you know. And I was trying to recreate the sound for the, for the, for the bass in always, and I was thinking. This is ridiculous. I made it on a, a toy home keyboard for kids, and it's ended up being the, the sound that you know I can't get that sound on one of these posh synths. So it's, I think it's hard. You know, it's not always about what you've got. You know, I think. I mean, actually, I think that when we had too much gear, it, I always always think about this analogy where you get if you have a horse and you put it between two bales of hay, it will starve to death because it doesn't know where to eat from. You know, and we were a little bit like that with the synthesizers. We had so much gear. We had all this amazing stuff and I used to sit there and kind of just look at it you know just put, um, switch it all on look at the lights switch some lights off have a couple of beers and go oh wow you know and not actually get any music done so yeah but uh, there you go anyway I'm rambling <laughs> I, um, if I ever needed three instruments in my lifetime except for the garage band software that I'm using I'll get yeah a Gibson or Fender bass guitar. I love bass guitars. I, I think of myself as a mini square pusher. I would get a Nord or one of those Korg workstations because I, I love yeah. the sort of modules and manipulations of sound that you can do on that. And it's also MIDI, so you can't go wrong. And maybe for that matter, a uh, drum sampler by uh, Akai. They call it Ak Akai, right? You broke up there, actually. So what is is that? Oh, I was just saying about drum sample and machine, like an Akai. Or a K? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, um, I've got different pronunciations for certain things as well. But um, I'll get to the next question. I don't know if this might be a little uh, of a sensitive matter, but um, the name origins behind Bent, because someone had told me that uh, means, like, LGBT, and I always was on the assumption, like, Oh, uh, like uh, pet shop boys, right? Well, you asked what happened then. From my point of view, I just saw you. You kind of froze, and then you went blah, 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 pet shop boys. <laughs> you were saying it was just a touchy subject or something. Oh, yeah. What was it again? Sorry. Um, is the word uh, the name origin for bent related to LGBT? Oh right, yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, when it started, when it started, I mean, in England. Especially in the 80s, it was a word that was thrown around for everything. And Nail and myself, we used to kind of say, you know, like, we used to watch a, a lot of daft films like Superman 2, you know, with Terence Stamp and, you know, really bad Arnold Schwarzenegger films and just just all sorts of different stuff. And Nail go, oh, that film's so bad, meaning it's daft. And then when I turned up and moved into the house with him, I had all these, you know, all these random records just like, I mean, I'm just going to grab some random ones here, you know. You know, just, well, you know. Actually, that's not too bad, that one. Um, but I used to kind of have all these records, and you go, where the hell are you getting these records from? They're really bent, you know. It's a very, especially a Nottingham word. And it, it, it does have negative connotations to it as well, but I think at the time we just thought, well, we're just kind of reusing the word in a way that we want to use. And, yeah, you know, I guess it was 20 years ago when people... Maybe we weren't necessarily sensitive, sensitive to it, but there's, you know, no malice behind it at all, you know. But, yeah. <laughs> I was always curious about that because um, some of my friends, uh, one of them is uh, bisexual, and uh, he didn't take offence to uh, Ben. He actually thought it was quite lovely music, and um, he was listening to I Remember Johnny, and then he heard a girl like you, and he was thinking himself like Pet Shop Boys, and uh, they're a famous group that are... Uh, you know, known in the uh, gay club scene as well, so he was kind of curious about that. That was a question that was mainly for uh, my mate who I'm from Los Angeles. Yeah, it's, it's funny because when I first when we when we first got together, I remember a few people used to think that Nell and I were you know lovers, and the first and the, I mean the first thing that we did was called I Love My Man, you know. So yeah, um, there, there you go. <laughs> but, uh, the Nottingham scene. Where do I begin with this one? Because not only 
Ben is the greatest uh, band in this city, but also you've got oh. Sleaf and Mods, Jason Williamson. Uh, Jason, yeah. I'm sure you've yeah. probably collaborated with uh, him on some of his songs, or um, he no, works see, with you guys. Did. Uh, we never did. I found well, Jason. Jay used to live with Nail for a while, uh, a long time ago. But um, there was a time when he was coming in and doing some demos with us. Um, it was actually when we were doing the second album, but it just never really transpired. I guess it was just one of those things where he came in and we had a lot of fun and we did some music together, but we never finished anything off, you know. And he's kind of gone off onto his tangent and done amazingly, really, with what he's doing. Um, but, I mean, to be honest, I mean, you've got Crazy P, you've got, I mean, they, I love Crazy P, such lovely people as well, and then, I mean, there's just so many people in Nottingham who've made music in Neon Heights, so I love them a lot as well, there's Six by Seven Gang, and then there's, um, I mean, all the DIY stuff, all the house music, I mean, that's where Nail, what Nail was doing before I met him, you know, so, it was kind of nice at one point, especially in the early days of Ben, we used to walk into town and it's a small city, you know, and you just, everyone was just either a musician or an art student or a fashion student. It was really fun, you know? Yeah. It's a great city. I haven't been Good to it many times. times. <laughs> um, I haven't been to Nottingham many, many times myself. Um, last time it was my pass through, I was with my family. We were heading over to Scotland and we were seeing uh, Sherwood Forest and we were thinking, oh, Robin Hood. And because he's such a strong figure in British folklore and that sort of working class element, you know, take from the rich, give to the poor, it kind of explains where the knots sound comes from, especially from uh, Mr. Jason well, Williamson, and Andrew Nell, Fern. <laughs> me and Nell are constantly sampling people and stealing samples from things. And so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's a funny thing, actually. Um, we were in New York once, myself and Nell, and there was a homeless guy sat in the corner. We ended up speaking to him for a bit, and he goes, hey, where are you from? And we said, oh, Nottingham. And we went, many tights, I love that movie. <laughs> 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 no, that's what I, t I tell all my friends who are from Canada or the US. Um, they, they say, oh, Robin Hood, that's that's so great. You know, give to rich, take to the poor, you know? <laughs> In my exactly. bad American accent, but, uh, you know, somewhere has to start from somewhere. Um, yeah. On the next question as well, with the artwork, uh, you depicted a red cow, um, which yeah. I think was quite hilarious in a way, because it reminded me if it was a celebration of British farming culture or the tranquility of the British countryside. I mean, you'd think so with this hat that I'm wearing. You'd think I was, you know... Give you know, big up the farming um, <laughs> industry. Yeah, no, I mean, to be honest with you, um, there's no, I mean, there might be a very se secretive hidden message with, with all those cows. I think some of it's because I live out in the middle of nowhere, you know, and uh, I'm surrounded by farmers and cows anyway. <laughs> That's quite funny. The, the cows were actually taken from, in England, the pictures were taken in England. <laughs> on, uh, um, but yeah, it's quite funny because we had to do like, some press shots and while Mel was over, I said, right, we need to go and get a picture with some cows. And it was actually quite easy because it only had to go about, you know, a kilometre down the road and, you know, there's loads of them. But yeah, there's, there's always sort of daft meanings and daft little things in the artwork. And I think sometimes we'll, we always start to forget ourselves because there's just so many daft things in there. And sometimes we just laugh at something. We just go, that is just such a random thing to have as artwork, you know. Some of the earliest stuff that was done, um, Rob White, who did all the very early stuff, like the EPs and Programme to Love and that, he'd, you know, just like we had a wedding, well, Programme to Love was meant to be a wedding banquet, you know, with our heads at the table, and it's like, I don't even know why we did that, but it was just, it was just a lot of fun again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I miss the, the uh, old artwork of the old um, albums, particularly Everlasting Blink uh, with the... Uh... The, the eyeball, eye yeah. that's stuck that's inside the, the pickled thing. jar. I thought, oh, I'm not going to have pickled onions from a jar at the chippy again. <laughs> but you know, it's all it's all great stuff. And the um, one with the flowers, aerials, which um, my grandmother yeah. loves uh, that artwork because it, it's almost like something you would put on the wall um, while you're having you, you know, your sip of twinings. Well, that's JJ Burridge who did that artwork. <laughs> 
it's everything sort of everlasting blink onwards actually yeah with the exception of a couple of things I um, are the best of and the exercise stuff but yeah he's he's responsible for all of that stuff yeah well more power to him um in case if i ever you know make an ep or an album that sells on uh, a particular label i won't name which one um i'll definitely say hey i know simon mills can you help me out please <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> you know what I think you have some of the best uh, album covers this side of um, Boards of Canada My Bloody Valentine and Funky Porcini I don't know if that's oh, uh, an endorsement well Boards of Canada I mean wow thank you yeah I love their artwork their, all their imagery is so I love the influences of it I remember once one night I was sat there watching the Andromeda stream thinking god this really reminds me of Boards of Canada for some reason then I actually tweeted it and someone said, oh, well, you're fine, that, you know, and then I started to realise, oh, my God, of course, that's where they were drawing all this stuff from, you know, it's just amazing, so, such strong imagery, brilliant. I would agree with that, though, um, especially with the faceless um, personas, especially on Music Has the Right, and uh, some of the more sort of trippy kaleidoscope imagery of Gay O'Gardi, um, it's the sort yeah. of thing that, you know, people will say, oh, you can, you know, roll a blunt, because in parts of the US you can smoke cannabis recreationally and uh, have a token enjoy to the sounds. I don't get high off drugs, I actually get high off music and uh, Bent and some of the others are definitely um, what's the word? Culprits. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, um, on a more sort of technical matter, instrumentation yeah. for your music now, I know you talked about this a little bit earlier about the um, Korgs and the Moogs, but um, which one would you say is the best one out of them lot? The Nords, the Korgs, or the Moogs, or the Rolands? Because I saw on an earlier video, I think you've done with a, another bloke, and uh, you were talking about the uh, <laughs> cool. It depends what it's for, really. I think if I thought, what, what have I used the most? It's really difficult to say because, I mean, we've got, like, DX7s and stuff from the late 80s, mid 80s, early 80s. And it's like, you know, I'll go through a phase of never playing. A, I mean, like, the DX7 sat there for a long time and then suddenly it's being used all the time, you know, and then it'll go back into a box for a while. But, I mean, the, the Moog, you know, that, I mean, that's been used on so much stuff. And it's been MIDI retrofitted as well. So that's really kind of cool. So I can trigger it off with the computer and that. Um I really don't know. But I say, I mean, I'll tell you what, one of the newer synths that I've got, which I, I think is brilliant, and a lot of people are just thinking they're over, underrated, well, overrated, is uh, the Deep Mind, which is, you know, I mean, I mean, we've had so many different classic synths over the years, all the EMS stuff, and we've had Elka Synthexes and uh, PG, PG Waves, uh, and that is so versatile. It's, it's such a, it's quite a powerful synth for what it is for the price. It's brilliant. Um, but yeah, I couldn't put my, I couldn't put it down to one. I couldn't put it down to one. I mean, I tell you what, I do love the um, the SA two nine, which you probably can't see there. That oh, the I, I see it right there. It's the Roland. Yeah, so the Roland SA twenty one is very dead. Obviously, they're popular. Everyone loves that. But the A nine, I I kind of prefer. It's kind of got more of a warm sound to it, and it's kind of I don't know. It's kind of more seventies sounding in some way, you know. But yeah, it's difficult to say. I mean, there's a patch on the, there's a D50 as well, which is kind of almost, you know, there's a phase where no one would go near a D50 for years because it was just so bad. But now, you know, like the last five years, there's been so many records made because it's almost quite kitsch, you know. But there's a track, there's a, there's a pad on that called Soundtrack that, I mean, I basically, I think we bought the keyboard pretty much without sound, you know. Yeah, but yeah, it's difficult to say, and that's why, that's why I end up with so many keyboards, you see, because just one wouldn't be enough. <laughs> hey, you know, the more the variety, the better, um, you know, because you've established yeah. yourself for quite a few years, so you deserve all those synthesizers in many ways. Um, for me, you know, if I had the, uh, you know, the moolah and the options, I would uh, definitely go with the core because I actually used to live not too far away from their headquarters. I think it was like in Bletchley or Milton Keynes. I li didn't live too, too far away. And, you know, nearby you also had Marshall amplifiers as well. So I cut 
from musical well, cloth. Yeah. Well, this is it. If you've all near that. See, we love Cogs as well, actually, come to think of it. Um, I mean, it's funny, isn't it, how things come around as well? Like the Korg M1, we've laughed at for years as well. We used to go, God, can you remember when everybody had a Korg M1 and then they went out of fashion and suddenly, I mean, probably about 10 years ago, all these house records start happening again. You know, it's funny how these things go around in circles, but... Yeah, a lot of their analog stuff. I mean, we've got a Korg vocoder over there, BC-10, up on the... Uh, just there, yeah. I don't know if you can see. Well, I actually yeah. think I do. Was that the same one that you used to do that song? I'm trying to think of it. It sounds like Zap and Roger. It was on. Oh, is that, I, I'm thinking that might be. Uh, you're trying to do side ons in love there. I think. It was on um, Program to Love. And yeah, was... yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's um, that was a that was actually an EMS um, vocoder, which I mean they're just like hen's teeth now. Those things are. We somehow acquired one from a friend, and it didn't work. And we lived above some guy who somehow managed to get it to work for a while, which was mad. So yeah, so we had that. But yeah, we did use a vocoder that that cork though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm always interested in the uh, music technology aspect of it, um, especially how you manipulate sounds and all that, especially uh, vocal features. Because um, growing up, I would watch a lot of a particular show that I was curious they might have played some of your music or not. Um, are you familiar with Jam, Chris Morris? Yeah, yeah, I love Chris Morris. God, yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I know some of this, you know, people say, oh, his stuff is offensive or it's uh, too dark, but um, Jam was definitely one of my favourite programmes because it plays <laughs> that sort of ambience and trip-hop music in the background to sketches that are quite bizarre, and I always thought no, they no, should have played no, Ben <laughs> on Jam. It's weird because we heard that Chris Morris was into Ben at one point. I remember this years ago, and that was like, the, I was so chuffed, you know, I was so happy about it. Because I'm just a massive fan of his stuff as well. I mean, I love, obviously, things, well, everything that he's done, really. I mean, even, I mean, yeah, even watching the IT crowd do the night, you know, just, yeah, I love him. It's brilliant. <laughs> and when he gets really out of order as well, to be honest, you know, the darker the humour, it kind of makes me laugh even more, to be honest. <laughs> but, yeah. He, he was he, he was very kind of uh, outrageous, though, wasn't he? Really? No, he uh, was. He done that one TV special on Barca that, uh, yeah, I, I was too young to see at the time. But then I saw it years later. I was like, oh my goodness! Yeah. I'm glad I uh, saw this in a contained setting. The VPN, yeah, yeah we're, we're yeah. gonna <laughs> cut that conversation short. But I think his best work is. Um, Jam as well as uh, early episodes of Brass Eye. He definitely knows his stuff. Oh, right. I'd yeah, like to yeah. see him make an album. He's a yeah. great musician. He actually makes his own music. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't actually know that. No. All oh, right. Okay. I think he collaborated with Amon Tobin or something on a song or two like, called Bad Sex. So, yeah. But, That's um, familiar. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> Go on the uh, next question as well. Um, your music video legacy, because I know with uh, Swollen Always, you definitely had quite a bit of a budget there. Also referencing the uh, space landing of '69 with Neil Armstrong and then King Kong, which I always thought was very hilarious. But is it wrong to say to you lads that uh, I used to get you guys confused with the Avalanches because there was a music video that they done. They're Australian called Since I Left You. I found a yeah, world selling who. <laughs> they came around the same time, weren't they? A similar era. Um, no, not at all. I think um, I love, it's a compliment. They they did some great stuff. Um, I've not actually caught up with them because they did some stuff recently, haven't they? But I've not I've not caught up with what they've been doing at all. They have um, only really done like one album after since I left you, and it was like Wildflower. Um, sort of came and gone. Yeah, they're very similar because obviously the sample type thing going on, and it's quite nostalgic and fluffy, and it's got the really pretty female vocal thing going on in it as well. So 
Definitely, yeah. That's why I used to get you a lot confused with avalanches, but once I you know, saw photos of you and you were a multi-group, uh, because they had about yeah. like seven or eight people DJing and stuff, and they're from yeah. Australia, and you're from Knott's. I thought, okay, that explains <laughs> the little difference there, but um, just a little after four, I told you. Um, but I will say about Swollen or Always, whichever one you want to talk about, how did you get that music video made? Because I thought that was brilliant. Well, they were, um, you know... Oh, thank you. Well, it was when, uh, you know, because obviously we were on Ministry, um... They, at the time, said, well, you know, we've got to get a video made. So it was just one of those things where they send out um, the music to all these different directors and the directors to send the treatments in. We were reading like, loads of different ones. And then the first one, the, well, I read one that just said, right, Simon and Nail go to the moon. I was like, right, well, we're doing that one. You know, we're doing that one. And at the time, Nail was doing a lot of, <laughs> Nail does a lot of impressions of people. You know, one of the ones that he used to do was Patrick Moore. And whenever I was on the... Uh, the train with him, you know, he'd be going, I didn't go to bed just yet. And we were saying, oh, you know, wouldn't it be great to get in touch with Patrick Moore um, and get him in the video? And in fact, the girl I was seeing at the time, she, she it was her like this, she goes, you should write to him. And, you know, so wrote to him, yeah, and he decided to be in the video and everything. And he didn't actually want to be paid for it either. He refused to be paid. Um, you are. He, he just had a stroke as well. He was recovering from a stroke. He had no use of one arm when he did that video. And he actually said to me, he goes, I would have, he, he would have loved to have paid the glockenspiel on it, but he obviously couldn't do it at that time because of his health. But the fact that he refused to be paid was, you know, ridiculous. But, but yeah, it was a, a lot of fun making those videos. Although the space suits we used to call the pain machines because it was, you know, I sound like some thespian, you know, but we were like in this space suit for 18 hours and they were crippling. They were so, so painful to wear. But I thought, right, I've had a lightsaber fight with Nail now on the moon. That's kind of, I, you know, when the director said cut, I went, right, you can shoot me now. I'm, I'm done. I'm happy. It was the only thing I put. <laughs> Reenacting Star Wars. <laughs> it's the music video you're probably best known for because, uh, you know, I remember seeing that years ago on MTV Dance in the Mornings. That's when, that's how I actually found my foundation and love for this kind of music is MTV Dance chilled sessions oh. it's showing like sundays at like 7 a.m or something i was having my muesli oh <laughs> th those times i'll never get them back again and then next thing they played that music video then they played avalanches and then they played one of your collaborators john marsh from the beloved for sweet harmony and i thought oh that video yeah. was a bit racy it's got implied nudity i thought hmm, can you show that at 8 a.m in the morning <laughs> Probably the best time. <laughs> uh, they're a massive fan of John's, as I say. Yeah, um, he's just a legend, really. Um, so talented. He's actually got me into things as well. Like when we did a beautiful, what beautiful otherness. One of the lyrics is "Kind Hearts and Coronets," and I said to him, "What is that?" He goes, "It's actually an old Ealing film that he was referencing, and it's brilliant. It's got um, Alec Guinness in it, and he plays I don't know, maybe ten or fifteen. He, he plays all the characters in this film." It's brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. As John say, talented for just weaving in these odd little um, references to things, you know, just beautiful little things that he weaves into things. So, yeah, I'd love to do some more with him, and we both would, yeah. Well, tell uh, Mr. Marsh I said hi. He's uh, a great singer, and um, I'm definitely a fan of Happiness and Conscience, uh, the two albums that, you know, he's probably most known for. Um, please don't tell him I was talking about Sweet Harmony, because I've He's probably a little bit pissed off about that one because everyone says, oh, they only just know us because of that music video, the nudity. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, another one, because I know, you know, promotionals, um, I know it's a lot of your music's on ads as well, um, especially yeah. like HM Revenue and Customs, they put one out and they put Thick Ear. And I was like, hey, I know that particular tune. Like, if you don't pay your... Um, income taxes or something by April 1st, you could save a penalty. And then Top Gear, before um, Wild Herd Jeremy Clarkson kind of destroyed it, he, they put Private Road, my favourite Bent song. That's a, oh, really? Wow, thank you. Yeah, it's, I, I just, you know, on the Thick Ear thing, you know, it's quite funny because at the time, I ate about 
you know, four grand or something to the inland revenue. I just haven't got around to paying it. And, uh, you know, he said bright blue hair. And uh, one day there was a knock on the door and um, it was the inland revenue. I said, oh, hello, Mr. Mills. Yeah, but just to, just to let you know that you're, you know, there's an outstanding uh, amount here of £4,000 that you need to pay. So, well, we've actually given you some music in an advert. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I make music for a living and, um, we've we've licensed some music to the inland revenue, but they haven't paid the label yet. So, but as soon as the label gets paid by you, that means I can then pay you the tax. And he was he, he looked at me as if I was, and I said, "Oh, if you don't believe me, I'll go upstairs and I'll go and get the album because I got the album. You know, I was going to play it to him and say, look, it's on the advert, but it just hasn't been paid yet.'" And he goes, "No, no, that's that's actually a very good excuse. Uh, no, I believe you. I believe." He was just wondering what the hell is. It's sort of one of the most random excuses to not paying tax. Everybody was completely true. They hadn't paid me at the time, so I couldn't pay them the tax bill until they paid me, and then I paid it. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew about that, I probably wouldn't have asked that question. That sounds no, uh, no, quite I'm a sensitive about. financial matter. <laughs> no, I'm glad. I mean, I thought it was quite funny that he was coming around giving me a thick ear, and we'd given them a thick ear, you know, so there you go. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that song. It's a nice little jingle. I wondered what you were doing. <laughs> it's a thick ear that I'm doing. It's sort of like a, you know, a little whistle. Um, as far as uh, everything with your uh, labels that you've been in, because I know right now you're on uh, Godlike, and then you also release stuff on Bandcamp. But out of all the labels yeah. you've been on, what would you say is your favourite? I don't know. I mean, God likes a nice one to work on because it's run by Nick Hansen, who's been managing us since '98, and he's a mate of ours, you know. But he manages us, and um, it's just like we just go and do what we want to do, and he looks after the whole thing, you know. That's kind of like the premise of Ministry. They basically because we were at, like the first bands to be on Ministry, and they said to us, "Well, just make whatever you want, do whatever artwork you." Want. You want to make whatever videos you want to I mean that's just an absolute dream situation really but i guess it was just difficult at the time because we were new we were almost like guinea pigs in a way for that label but um but it, you know it did well and yeah but i mean i love bank camp as well i love releasing stuff directly you know because because i love making the artwork i love doing everything you know so it's quite rewarding to do that. And also, you know, so especially now with the COVID thing, I mean, the plan was, is, I mean, the thing was we were we were doing all this stuff so that we can go and tour again. I mean, that's the, basically that's what's going to happen with the Ben thing. Um, whether it happens to be digital for a while, we have to stream, I don't know. But, um, yeah, and, you know, Bandcamp has just been so amazing for supporting musicians, you know, because Spotify pay, I think it was, it less than a peanut for each stream. You know, and uh, yeah, it, it's crazy. You know, and Apple take thirty percent of each sale. You know, I, I, I mean, I can tell you, I mean, Spotify is great for just having convenience and being able to switch something on and listen to it. And I, I completely get that. And I think it's good to put your music there as well. But then sometimes when you want to just release something and have something out, you know, we said last month, let's come out with a quick surprise. Let's do like an, an exercise EP that, you know, we haven't even really announced. We're just going to do it out of the blue. And it was kind of fun to do, you know. But so it's, you know, it's nice to have things on different platforms, really. But yeah, I think God like, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, he, Nick's been great with it, really. And he's, he's the one that kind of got us, helped, enabled us to get this stuff back on the road again, you know, because it's, well, you know, it's an expensive thing to make music because you've got to live while you do it. It takes months and months to write the music sometimes, you know. So, yeah. Oh no, I I totally understand that. Um, yeah, everyone has their everyone has their reasons for why things are the way they are. Um, I know I was asking another musician. Well, I'll probably give it away. Um, it's uh, James Braddle, Funky Porcini, and I was asking why he's not on Ninja Tune anymore. But um, hopefully, I will be hearing by next week. But I've been hearing. Ninja Tune and even Warp, two of my favourite labels, have been cutting some of their lineup because they're not doing enough in sales or um, vinyl yeah. and uh, streaming. So, you know, I understand, but it does mean, you know, I have certain suspicions. Like, they keep on the top talent. 
So if they keep Chemical Brothers, they'll get rid of Add Enter the X and Broadcast. They keep Nine Inch Nails, but they'll get rid of In Me or Enter Shikari. Enter Shikari is actually a band I actually know quite well. Right, right. Excellent, yeah. Now, it's, it's one of those, I mean, it's one of the things when you get on a large label. Anyway, we were on EMI for years, you know, and then I think they spent a lot of money on a Robbie Williams album, you know, and they had to cut loads of jobs. I think they spent, I think it was one year, they spent millions and millions on Mariah Carey and Robbie Williams, and then all of these smaller bands disappeared. Some of the people that we knew that worked there disappeared. It was like, you know, they put all their eggs in this one basket. It's funny, really, but... Yeah, I mean, it's funny times at the moment as well, because obviously uh, there's so many people I know that can't go and perform, so they're having to find new ways to do things. But I think it's kind of, it's really testing people, you know, especially with the streaming and that kind of thing, which is something I'm, I've been meaning to do for so long. But my internet connection here, where I am, has been so bad. I only upgraded it just before Christmas, so I could do some streaming. <laughs> I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been able to have done this interview before, because it was so slow. <laughs> well, you're doing a lot better than I am. Um, I actually don't have the internet at home uh, for one or two reasons. Uh, one, my uh, local access provider won't install broadband in the areas efficiently. And number two, I, ha I have a, a bit of an addiction to um, internet and logging in, so I often like to do stuff before I head over to work or in the car, so that way it sort of curbs <laughs> my... Uh, addiction you know some people yeah. musicians they like to you know snort coke and uh drink themselves to death but me a not so much <laughs> <laughs> because there's so much to explore music and films yeah. it, it, it's never ending i just even saw just yesterday coming to america and judas and the black messiah after i left work because i also do film reviews as well so I'm always busy at every sort of step that I can. I even saw some of the exercise videos that you published on your Instagram, including that one where you've got an Apple phone emoji look like a lion. And I was like, that would have creeped me out 10 years ago, but now it doesn't. <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. I think that is... Um, that's, I think that is Lord Charles. There's a puppet called Lord Charles from the 1970s and early 1980s. It was like a, a ventriloquist puppet, you know, um, nailing myself. And Nick, the manager Nick, he, he was always laughing at stuff like that. We were always laughing at puppets and Sesame Street and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, let's put some of that in the video. <laughs> hey, you know, whatever works there, you know, I, I'm also a fan of puppetry myself. One of the first albums I think my mother bought, I, I never really listened to it that much, was Maloko's Things to Make and Do. And I mostly just liked the album as a child because it had um, some puppets and cartoonish toy characters on the logo. And then next to it, you had yeah. Prodigy's Music for the Jilted Generation. Rest in peace, Keith Flint, in case if he's here with us in heaven. And that album cover scared me <laughs> when I was a little nip. Now it doesn't anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I just want to tell you because... Your music guy, so. When you're saying about, um, hang on. Yeah, when I was uh, a kid, my dad always used to play this to me. The World of the Worlds, and I uh, just used to be terrified of it. Absolutely terrified. Scared oh, Orson life, Wells. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, this isn't the recording of the radio, that's just an album, but. Um, yeah, but the artwork just used to freak me out, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I, I'd never really heard that um, one about War of the Worlds. I know they said about News of the World, there was like this episode of an adult cartoon called Family Guy, and uh, the baby with the British accent, Stewie, he's like all scared of Queen's uh, News of the World album. He's like, do you want to look at this, Stewie? Are you serious? <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious because I could relate to that to some degree with um, Aphex Twins, Richard D. James album, Prodigy's music for the Jilted Generation, and uh, oh no, for some reason that FC Kahuna music video hailing with the um, barefoot girl on the piano being spied on um, creeped me out for some reason. I'm not saying that. I'm not seeing that one uh, visage fade to grey. The video to that used to scare the life, life out of me when I was a kid. It was like 
looks like clown's faces and masks spinning around. And when you're five years old, you're taking everything as a given, you know. <laughs> oh, no, of course. Cool. It's, it's very weird. Even things that are, like, 18 certificate, um, but, like, you or PG can sometimes freak you out uh, when you're young. Yeah. It's uh, very strange. Very strange indeed. My father was scared by yeah. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and I was like, hmm? That's a you! <laughs> <laughs> but I'm getting a little bit off tangent here. My apologies, though. Um, so I will say... Because I know you've been on EMI and Ministry, who do a lot of compilations. Again. That's how I knew them for. Um, but out of Ninja Tune, Warp, 4AD, Pork Recordings, and Mute, which would you say is your favourite out of the bunch? Oh, jeez. That's really difficult, because obviously... I mean, I think I'd have to say Warp, because... I mean, there's been times actually where I wasn't necessarily into what. There's been times where I thought they kind of went a little bit too experimental, and I didn't. It didn't resonate with me. But then they'd suddenly come back with something amazing, and then I'd go, ah, you know. Again, they kind of seem to be ahead of the curve a lot. Anyway, so oof, I don't know. I say warp. They've had them. They've yeah. I mean, they're brilliant on it, really. And I mean, I love so many different artists off that label. And, yeah, I, I would agree that too. Yeah. Actually, you probably would have been a good fit on that label, but yeah, I, I do get with the experimental stuff, um, like Orteca, for instance, I is... <laughs> well, I think with Nail and I aren't necessarily avant-garde. We, you know, we're not kind of... We're not kind of trying to do something that's futuristic and thinking out ahead of the game, like a lot of those artists, like, you know, Orteca, all those kind of artists that are just really bonkers, you know, and they really do think ahead of the curve. They're, they're reinventing the wheel each time, where Nail and myself, we just kind of go into our own little universe, and I guess we don't try and be futuristic or anything. We just, a lot of it's actually nostalgic rather than futuristic, you know, because we're kind of digging into the past rather than sort of trying to be the future. Yeah, so maybe that's, yeah, maybe that's it. Oh no, I would agree with you there. Um, sometimes yeah, I I do the same thing too. I've sampled Joy Division, Redskins, I think um the Smiths on one particular song all together as a sound collage, Public Enemy style, and I put it to some sort of audio bullies streets type of sounding beat, and I called it Nostalgia Rules. More like nostalgia makes you a fool, and I done some spoken word on it. And uh, I didn't publish it yet because uh, I don't know if I might violate copyright or licensing issues. But um, if you like, on your free time, I'll send you a link to it. It's a hilarious little tune <laughs> about uh, my my life, my life. But uh, yes, um, I will get back onto more bent stuff in this moment with um, the exercise and take songs for this instance. Are they mainly used for test purposes or to build a sound collage to your listeners? Because in many ways, the songs reminded me a little bit of what... You remember Enigma? Oh, Enigma, yeah, yeah. Um, Curly MC used to put those little pan pipes in the very beginning of each and every one of his albums. So it was like a test or an intro of sorts. That's what it reminded me of. Were those the purpose of the exercise songs or take <laughs> I don't know I think the purposes of exercises for us is that we just try to just have as much fun as possible and like when I've, whenever I hear pan pipes they kind of make me laugh a little bit you know do you know what I mean they just got that thing about them that I mean to be honest when I was a kid there used to be a band called Incantation back in the 80s and my dad used to play it all the time I used to kind of like it because they had like a flirty theory I think but um no, it's not, it's not like that, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There's all these silly little references and people go, are they kind of referencing, you know, Enya or Clannard and, you know, it's like even stuff that maybe frowned upon or whatever, but yeah, no, I'll just... <laughs> yeah, you see that, I, I, I like the idea of sticking pump pipes in because it's just, you know, yeah, a bit daft and a lot, like, yeah. Hey, I like that mixture of uh, sound collages and uh, effects all together. I think it makes it both maddening and beautiful at the same time. I definitely got yeah. that, especially from uh, a ribbon in my hair, where you um, sample an old uh, Nana 
song and you put some sort of um, African rhythm at the end and then put the uh, string quartet in the beginning. Yeah. And he heard me say... Sometimes we're kind of, um, you know, more juvenile when we're making stuff, I guess. And other times, you know, we kind of end up making something that's maybe possibly more, hopefully, thought-provoking or something like that. I mean, when I do my own stuff, I'm not necessarily having fun with Nail because I'm working by myself, so you don't tend to frank about as much. Um, but I've still slipped silly things into my own music, but um, it tends to be less less kind of um, juvenile, I guess, is the best way of putting it. But, <laughs> but yeah, there's still things that I, I mean, I love making music where I just think, that's really daft. And I'm happy with it. It's really daft, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, like when we did, you know, there's been loads of different songs, well, most of the music I've ever done, I've said that to be honest, but yeah, yeah, so there you go. Hey, um, hey, whatever works there, I suppose. Um, it almost sounds like from the way you sample, you say daft. You're probably even dafter than Daft Punk, who I know just recently disbanded for uh, some odd reason. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's mad really about but They've been around for such a long time as well, haven't they? You know? They have, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, they, they weren't that daft, were they? No, they not very... really. They uh, were actually quite smart and successful. And I, I mean oh, okay. daft in this sort of like bonkers sort of way in terms of music. But um, yeah. yeah, I'm actually... I hope they don't hear this over in France, but I'm glad they disbanded. I didn't like Random Access Memories because it came out the same year as Boards of Canada's Tomorrow's Harvest and My Bloody Valentine's Comeback. And there was an album that sounded kind of bentish called Public Service Broadcasting's Inform, Educate and Entertain. That I thought, wow, that's brilliant. Yeah. Have you heard of that? Yeah. I don't know. I, I think Neil mentioned that before, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think with the Daft Punk thing, I preferred... I mean, this is such a hipster thing to say, isn't it? You know, I prefer the old stuff. I mean, I'm sure that's what people say about bands. <laughs> I do. But, you know, it's like, um, yeah, it's just one of those, I guess. I mean, I obviously love all the sort of disco -y stuff. I mean, all the French disco -y stuff I loved anyway, you know. Um, I mean, that was actually massive, just as me and Noel were sort of getting together, really, you know. Because I think yeah. your there you go. Um, Program to Love came out the same year as Discovery. Unfortunately, you know, your album wasn't quite as well known as Discovery because it had the Japanese animation, it had the um, music videos and the uh, top billing songs on the top ten. So I was like, hmm, I wish I heard of it a lot earlier. Because I remember seeing this, well, I've got Discovery now, so I remember buying it thinking... Is it going to be better than ELO Discovery? Because I love ELO, you see. And I was thinking, well, you've got two, you've got two bands that are using um, spectral colours and, you know, futuristic imagery. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Kind of, uh, kind of, how old that album. Right. ELO is one of Britain's best-kept secrets. I personally think yeah. that they're a much better group than the Beatles. I know a lot of people from the Merseyside and Liverpoolians would kick me ass for saying that but I'm not uh, ashamed uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that to be honest yeah oh yeah. blimey <laughs> be glad you're in uh, wherever you are in uh, Northern Ireland are you're, you in Belfast or Derry well I wasn't I wasn't too far from Derry yeah, so I was living over the border in the for about five years but I live on the coast of um, Antrim now so it's just like the northeast coast. It's where they film Game of Thrones and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So it's yeah, it's very very sort of different to the central Nottingham. Yeah. Oh, I can't I'm imagine kind of... a lot of uh, cows in the countryside. Um, do you get yeah, to see yeah. Kit Harrington and Amelia Clark? <laughs> no, no, who are they? The uh, Game Maybe... of Thrones actors. Uh... Oh, oh yeah, you see, I've never watched it. I mean, everyone says to me. Oh, you should watch it. You know, it's got, you know, it's amazing. But I've just, 
I haven't got around to it because I'm still watching. Uh, well, I started watching um, Tales of the Unexpected again, and Columbo. I'm doing Columbo, the box set of Columbo for the fourth time in the last few years. So I'm basically living in the past. That's what I mean. I'm just basically living in the you know seventies and eighties. <laughs> <laughs> My mother's yeah. the same way. She still watches uh, old episodes of Perry Mason, Matlock, Flintstones. I watch Brass Eye and Alan Partridge and. Hell, even in between us, and in between us came out about ten or so years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, one of my favourite movies uh, is uh, Toy Story, which is a you know an anime. For, it's for children, but I really don't care. <laughs> no, I love, uh, Monsters Inc. for me is my. I just love Monsters Inc. Love it. Yeah, but yeah, I love Toy Story. <laughs> Hey, it's a great film, and you know Randy Newman. He's a great musician. This, yeah. yeah. You should sample him next time you get a chance. But you might go penniless because of the uh, royalties and licensing. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I-, I will say on another end. Um, so we talked about the exercise ones, and uh, what was your favorite album or song growing up? Um, when I before came to the electronic and ambient stuff. I was a more of alternative and metal person. One of my favourite songs right. growing up was Faith No More's Epic. You want um, it all, but you can't have it. <laughs> no, the, I used to listen to the real thing quite a lot growing up. If I'm a girlfriend, she's when we first met, I was like, what are you into? And she's like, you know, into things like Weird Science, Adam and the Ants, Faith No More, you know. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. Uh, Kate Bush, all this kind of stuff. Uh, growing up wise, I think uh, it's again it's a difficult one because obviously there's loads of different phases. But I remember being a kid. I think the first time I ever got blown away by the production of a record was Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Welcome to the Pleasure Dome because Trevor Horn just made that album just sound so huge. I think it's like one of the first albums to be multi-track digitally as well. I think, but I mean the production in it is just all these atmospheric things going on in it and I remember just thinking just loved the, the, the production of that record when I was a kid because it's almost like a journey you know but then I loved a lot of Pet Shop Boys stuff when I was growing up and yeah again it's like, I mean I both Nail and myself loved a lot of hip hop as well it's really difficult to put our fingers on you know loved Depeche Mode and um, yeah when I grew up I loved Adam and the Ants as well because they was just so different to everything else that had ever happened you know and there's still are, you know, there's no one Prince ever Charming, that. Prince Charming. <laughs> my father yeah, and so, mother grew up on yeah, the same just, stuff as you lot. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, you know, I didn't have really different, yeah, I don't know, there wasn't anything that I think was anything strange or that anything nobody else, else had ever heard of, you know. It's quite, yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, you know, I, I like a lot of the same stuff as y- you guys as well, um, because I used to listen to a lot of 80s new wave and 70s post-punk sort of stuff in the car, and my father and my mother used to play it on the tapes, and I hold those tapes quite dearly to the point that, you know, when I done a song called Nostalgia Rules, I, I featured Joy Division's Love Will Tear Us Apart again, and The Smiths, There Is A Light That Never Goes Out, or... Um, was it how soon is now? I can't remember. It was a few years ago, but uh, hey. yeah, I hold the same sort of songs as you did quite hardly. And uh, oh, don't even oh, get no, me look, started on oh, Kate Bush. What a gorgeous yeah. looking woman, and from yeah, the same the... areas where my father and my grandparents grew up. Oh, really? Uh, Kent. I mean, Kate Bush for me is my favourite female artist. I can actually pinpoint it every single time someone asks me if someone says to me what's your favourite band or who's your favourite male artist I kind of that, but for some reason Kate Bush has just, just taken over my life <laughs> I've always loved her since I was a kid and she's always been again you know I think the people that she worked with had such a great influence on her you know she just ended up just so ahead of the curve again you know like working with like sampling and stuff like that and yeah love her well, she was definitely ahead of her time. I think she even worked with Brian Eno as well. And we all know Brian Eno is the king of electronic music. And 
electronic music uh, producing. We won't even go there because that's another topic in of itself. Um, but my favourite female artist is Bjork. And maybe in a runner-up, you got Belinda Butcher from My Bloody Valentine and uh, Mickey Berenyi from Lush and uh, Kelly Ali from Sneaker Pimps. That was a short-lived band yeah. that was kind of came out around the same time as you, but yeah. Yeah, it's weird because, I mean, there's Wendy Carlos. Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, the disco is on, really. But I think, for me, at Bjork, I mean, the, first, the, the debut is one of my favourite ever albums as well. You know, it's just so beautifully made as well. Um, yeah, so no, yeah, it's a very similar taste. So yeah, I, I miss her debut as well, but I think her best work is post. Um, I remember I saw that music video for It's So oh, So Quiet, shh, shh. <laughs> and you know, I was a young man, and you know, you don't get hormones until you're like in your teens, but uh, yeah, I, I started like, oh, I, I wish I could marry her when I was watching Bjork on the music video, I was like, and my parents were teasing me, even to this very day, about you love Bjork, don't you? You want to marry her after seeing It's So So Quiet, but uh, let's get into more personal matters. Uh, uh, so, so thankfully, you you can uh, um, hold yourself, because we only have two more questions left, and uh, the first to, yeah, the first one before the last will be encounters with other musicians i don't know if you've yeah. met any you know big names but um i will say i mean did you meet people like the chemical brothers or air luke viber richard d james and Ad yeah. to the x broadcast groove armada amon tobin well yeah the first time i ever dj was with groove armada and now because now could dj and i couldn't and I never even wanted to be a DJ, but then when we signed to ministry, they're like, right, you've got to go and do this, you've got to go. And I was like, oh my God, I don't even know. And I was absolutely, you know, I was nervous to say the least, and it's the best way of putting it. And uh, yeah, they were really, really lovely guys, actually. And uh, so it was like, a, it was actually, a, it was in a Levi's store on Oxford Street. And um, yeah, it was mad. There was like this whole music event with DJs on different floors. So that was a, one of the first times ever DJ was with that. And yeah, we did, we supported. Um, Chemicals as well and Orbital, um, Orbital, well, they're all lovely, lovely people, really. In fact, my Blue SH 101 is signed by Orbital on the underneath of it. It says even a bent clock tells the right time twice a day. Oh, that's so uh, it's awesome because uh, they definitely yeah. know how to work uh, their magic with the twiddly knobs. Paul and Phil Hartnell. Yeah, legends, and you know, I mean. The thing is, they signed it with a, an ultraviolet pen, and I don't have a light, otherwise I'd be showing it off now, you know. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, trying to think who else. Um, God, I mean, I was just trying to think. It's like Fat Boy Slim and Carl Cox. We did a gig with. Oh, there's loads of lots of people. Tom Middleton did quite a lot with, and um, yeah, I was just, I'm just trying to think. I, I'm just going back in time now. Yeah, but um, well, did you ever meet really, also I, Funky Porcini as well? never met Funky Porcini, no. I don't think I have. But you say you uh, met Cold Cut, um, Jonathan Black and... Um, no, Jonathan Moore and Matt Black. They're two great guys as well, from what I hear. Yeah. Yeah. I think we bumped into them at a big chill festival years ago. And, um, yeah. But there's one time we did a... It's quite funny, actually. We did a, we did a, uh, a gig with Cole Cox and Dave Seaman, DJ and 89 Beta. And um, before we went out to do the gig, you know, we were sort of in this back room having a couple of drinks and Carl said to me, he goes, are you looking forward to tonight then? And I said, well, I'm not sure. It's, gonna, it's a bit of a strange lineup." And he goes, why? And I said, because it's Ben Cox and Seaman. Because he laughed his head off too. <laughs> yeah, there you oh, go. yeah. Because it sounds like something sexual. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can see why some people would be like, you what, you cheeky little bastard. This <laughs> is a funny pace of that, Cox and Seaman, but there you go, you know. That's the, uh, I'll be telling my, uh, my uh, grandchildren, you know, what did you see when you grew up? Yeah, but yeah. No, but no, on a serious note, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I've um, been lucky, really, to just find out how many people are just such lovely people as well, you know. Just, yeah. 
you, you hear a lot when you're sort of starting out making music that there's a lot of bad reputations in music and you know I mean obviously there's lots of people in the industry that are a bit dodgy or whatever but most people I think we've met have just been absolutely amazing I mean, met Luke Viber he's lovely as well um, BJ Cole who we work with quite a lot um, we actually got to work with BJ because of the work that he did with Luke Viber such an amazing pedal steel guitarist you know um but yeah, just all lovely, lovely people. I wish I was there to even see you guys do your magic and work with all these collaborators because, um, you know, I hold a lot of these artists that I've just mentioned, yours, you included, to a high regard. And um, unfortunately, you know, at that time, I would have been too young to see anyone really, or let alone get into clubs back in 99 and 2000. But um if they ever do build yeah. a time travel machine, I would certainly be in the front lines and see you guys perform and visit places like God's Kitchen and Blue Note and a few others. I, yeah, I mean, if I had a time machine, I'd go back to when I just told you the anecdote about Ben Cox. I see just to see your face again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh. I see you. <laughs> this, <Moving along. laughs> anyway. this following yeah. event has been passed 15 certificate for strong sex references <laughs> I'm a, a bit of a film censorship nerd so you probably heard me insert a few references ah. to British we, film censors yeah. yeah exactly yeah <laughs> we'll have to but it's COX anyway it's spelled COX so it's fine oh yes um, yeah it's, it's not related to uh oh like a yeah. cockerel <laughs> or rooster, sometimes they call it. <laughs> but um, this will be the last question, and then you can go have your pee or have your um. What they say? You're probably gonna have dinner soon. Looking fidgety. <laughs> I know the something sanctified. I know um, it's been one of your sub projects that you've been doing outside of Bent, and uh, how did it come about? Um, because it's very interesting. Release it through Bandcamp because it reminds me of Bent's more groovier cousin. Did you do something sanctified as a means of uh, breaking away with the record labels or just doing it just for fun? It was a kind of love project, really. I mean, it still is because I'm doing some more at the moment. Uh, but what it was is when I first, when I lived in Donegal, I got asked to work. Well, Joel, Joel Hood was doing some stuff on International Feel and he was putting an EP out. And he asked me to produce it. So I got to know Joel. He came over and stayed with me for a week and I kind of was mixing his album. And every night, you know, we'd be sat there drinking wine and listening to all these DJs and all these all the house and disco stuff that we loved. And then, you know, we just kind of kept on hooking up and making more music together. And I ended up saying, look, you know, you should collaborate. Uh, I'd love to do some stuff where, you know, you're on some of my solo work. So he was on my Harmonic Jigsaws album. And as we were doing that, it was just... Every time I see Joel, we can't help but listen to sort of lots of house and disco, you know. Um, so we were saying, like, you know, it's just so nice making that stuff as well, where we're not necessarily writing songs and doing vocals. And you know, I love DJing as well, you know. I mean, it's funny how I started in the music thing by hating DJing and never wanting to be a DJ. I used to think DJs were just people who played everybody else's records because I was so arrogantly wanting to be a producer, you know, um, as a 17-year-old. And then you get older and you get put in a room with 500 people and you think, Mark, actually, this is quite difficult, you know, and it's not an easy thing to do at all. And it's an amazing, it's just such a rewarding, lovely thing to, you know, DJing I just love. So, yeah, so a part of that is just, we basically said, well, something sanctified is just everything that we would play out. What the kind of music, that we, we're kind of making the kind of music that we'd listen to, but we're kind of DJing the kind of music that we would make, if that makes sense. So, it all kind of comes from the same universe, which I guess it tends to be a sort of atmospheric, soulful house, and sometimes slightly disco-y. But and it's got it's got the Ben thing in there because obviously you know you know I'm in there making the chords and you know there's melodies and things, but it's often the same instrument. As well, you know, you're going to hear the same bass coming from certain synths and stuff like that. Will be in a Ben record, but then it'll be in a something sanctified record as well. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, yeah, we're trying to get some, we're just getting some more stuff done actually, because we did a record last year on Need One um, early on in the year, and then the, the COVID thing just happened, and it was a, a bit of a, a nightmare because we were sort of so excited about getting out of DJing, you know, and then 
so then I kind of went straight into doing locational <laughs> and then just went straight into ambient mode. Hey, um, keep on with the good work with something sanctified because uh, you definitely got something up on your hands right there. Even with uh, all the political and social upheaval that is occurring at this time, I'm actually very, very glad to have you on board, Mr. Simon Mills. Working families, you are definitely an excellent interviewee. Are being Thanks, replaced man, by new tax credits, so more people get more money. If you currently get tax credits, you'll be sent one new form automatically, but you need to fill it in now to continue claiming. And you can even apply online. Because if you're working or bringing up children, you're contributing to the UK. And if you've earned it, make sure you claim it. Because it's money with your name on it.